It's episode 164 of the Shea Station podcast, Monday, January 29th. Adam Onovino, back with the Mets. Let's talk about it. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Shea Station podcast. I think Jerry said he's listened to that intro 200 times. I might have him beat like 250 at this point because it's just so damn good. I mean, I can't believe it's it's all ours, and I'm really happy about it. I'm Jolly. He's Jerry. We got some news to talk about, and we got a mailbag to listen to. So, Jerry, how you doing on this fine Monday? I'm lovely. Uh, I'm excited to get into the mailbag. It's been a while. Yeah. Everything feels brand new with Shea Station <sighs> once again so nice. in such a good way. Thinking about how raw I was, especially coming into the podcast game, mm. and uh, I feel pretty good about where I'm at now. Always getting better. Hell yeah! Just like the show. What a he- heck of an intro! Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, the the intro is just immaculate at this point. Uh, the best part, I still think, is the low voice Shea Station at the end. It's just, no, what a nice touch. I was I was talking about your intro. Oh getting come to on, it, setting it up, come and on. then we're going. We're always getting better, Jerry. Let's get into it. Uh, Before we get to our mailbag, which, by the way, we had 25 voicemails, which is awesome. I was a little worried that people were uh, not aware of it. And then everyone came in with, honestly, really good questions. Like, we handpicked, I think, about a dozen of them. I really had to narrow it down because we don't have all the time in the world. But before we can get to that, we do have a little bit of Mets news, which is always nice to top off the the episode like this one. Uh, The Mets are bringing back Adam Onovino on a one-year $4.5 million contract. He's staying in New York for a third consecutive year. Uh, the Mets have kind of been rumored with a re- reliever talk for kind of a while now. Uh, we had a flurry of bullpen moves, which we're actually going to dive into later with a question uh, earlier in the offseason. Now this is one of the bigger moves, bigger money spending moves for the bullpen. Uh, Adam Adovino comes back. So we kind of reunite Diaz, Adovino, Smith, Rayleigh as kind of those core guys in the back. And the Mets get him actually at a little bit of a discount because the option that Adovino declined in his previous contract was worth about $2 million more. Uh, so Stearns gets a little bit of a bonus there. But I think we're all a little bit happy to see a guy that's been effective the past two seasons coming back to the bullpen uh, with a lot of question marks in that bullpen right now. Uh, I think he nailed it. Um, I always hoped he would come back. You know, I think the signs that he showed me last year, he's he changed his pitch mix a little bit. Mm. He started to do things a little bit different, which is all results-based for him. He's able to adapt on the role. I think he's got he's in for a good season. I was sad and understood that he was going to go test the free agent market looking for um, – a World Series victory. Sure. And the Mets get a discount, man. I think it, it stinks for him. That sucks for Adovino to yeah. lose two mil in return. Um, but I understand the decision on both ends, and I think it's a good fit. Yeah, I definitely think it's a good fit. I mean, you look back at the numbers, I mean, especially 2022, Adovino was like a really good, like a top reliever in the game, uh, and he was pitching for the Mets. He had an ERA right around two in 65 innings, and it was just really nice to have him Uh, as the eighth inning bridge guy. But I mean, it was the story with the entire bullpen last year. Uh, When Diaz went down, the plan kind of went out the window and everyone had to step up basically a level from what they were going to be asked for uh, in the offseason. Robertson was going to be the setup guy. Now he's the closer. Adovino, the seventh inning guy. Now he's the eighth inning guy. Also sometimes the closer. And I mean, you know, you can probably track the Diaz injury back to basically everything that went wrong with the team symbolically. Uh, But I still think all things considered, Adovino had a really nice season. Uh, The strikeouts were a little bit down last year, but it was in in exchange for a higher ground ball rate, which is always something really nice, like you alluded to uh, with his changing pitch mix. And it's tough, man. You know, he's in his age 37 now going on 38 season. It's tough to kind of try and adapt this late in your career. But Adovino is putting together a really nice back half to his career as one of the better relievers in the game. For the past five years at this point. So the Mets getting him uh, for less than $5 million, I think, is is a great deal. Yeah, and uh, the Mets needed it. They needed uh, they needed that back-end help. Um, I hope they're not done. I still think there's, yeah. there's some meat left out there. Um, but he definitely helps. Uh, in, a, in an area where the Mets direly needed some bullpen uh, help, I think it's it's a good fit. Yeah. So. 
happy with the signing. Courtesy of Andy Martino, who's had a really good offseason reporting on all things New York. Uh, he tweeted Shout out to you, by the way, for your breaking news. Oh, come on, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. you got to break it. You got to break it. We never signing. talked about it. I forgot. I know your second signing that you've broken. I know. Uh, yeah. People forget about the little Ben Heller thing. I had during winter meetings, which was, I cool. loved it. Um, yeah. Now breaking Robert Stevenson was cool. I don't think I'll ever do it again. Cause I was very stressed out. I said this to Chris Rose on baseball today, uh, that 45 minute window where I like, I wasn't sure if it was real or not. It was a guy I trusted, which is the only reason I sent it out. Um, but you know, that window you're thinking about all the times you saw beat reporters be wrong and everyone be really mean to them. Uh, you almost luckily, had your Bob Nightingale moment. I almost had my boob moment for sure. But luckily, uh, <laughs> Robert Murray came through, gave me a little credit, which was nice and a uh, good deal for the angels. Stevenson's a really good pitcher. Wanted him yep. on the Mets actually. Uh, but he gets 30 million. I think that was out of their price range. I agree. And, uh, something that I think the Mets were smart. Yeah. I mean, his success that's a, that's a huge contract for a reliever. So Very good for him. Recent success um, too. Um, yeah, exactly. But uh, uh, back to Martino, he said with Adam Adovino signed, uh, the Mets are still deciding whether to acquire another reliever. I'd expect them to continue to talk to the remaining free agents. So maybe they're not done. Who knows? Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're looking for discounts. I think the Adovino signings probably right in their price range of what they're willing to, right. to shell out. And, uh, I hope, I hope they get one more piece, man. They need one more piece. Right now, as it stands, uh, you can work with this bullpen between Diaz, Adovino, Rayleigh as seven, eight, nine, Drew Smith, who, who knows? Let's see. Uh, and then the He's back. He's going to give guys. you quality innings regardless. I right. hope he takes a step forward here and, uh, you know, maybe even pushes Adovino out of that eighth inning, allow him to have sure. a little bit more flexibility. I think that would be the ideal yeah. thing. Um, but he's going to still be a quality you know, arm in the bullpen. Yeah. I mean, you feel good about having him there, but this is kind of a, a put up year, like you mentioned last episode. Yeah. Uh, and then kind of these, uh, these projects in the back end, Sean Reed Foley, who is really good when he's not hurt, but he's been having trouble with that in recent years. Uh, Phil Bickford, who had some really fun moments in the second half last year, uh, Jorge Lopez and Michael Tonkin, who got major league deals uh, in the bullpen. So that fills out the eight guys that the Mets have back there. Uh, they've been linked to Wandy Peralta, which would continue to add to the mountain of former Yankees that are going to be on the roster next year, which I'm sure Mets fans aren't exactly thrilled about. But Wandy Peralta is a very good pitcher. I'd be very happy to have him in this bullpen. It would make the bullpen feel a lot more whole. I feel like he's going to be out of the price range that they're looking for. He's be. He's been excellent. Um, I think that's kind of a pipe dream. Yeah. But uh, which is yeah, strange to say, pipe dream for Juani Peralta, considering all the spending we did the last well, two I, seasons. To me, it's that's what I mean. To yeah. me, it's it speaks more not to what Wandy Peralta did last year and his success that he's had, but more to the Mets kind of you know, for the fans to think that they're they're just being a little stingy, yeah. um, they're not willing to push out there, and we'll, you know, we'll see what, what goes on, but. I feel like he's he's going to price himself out. I mean, he had an excellent year last year, so. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely earned a, a nice reliever contract. Um, but yeah, I think stingy is kind of the word because they haven't, yeah. to their credit, they haven't really overpaid for anything this offseason. They've constructed the roster on their terms. It's just, you know, not the star level high end talent that I guess Mets fans were getting accustomed to, getting comfortable with. But we'll, we'll see how things crack out. We still got a little bit more time before. You know, spring training rolls around, which is kind of right around the corner. Like, what did I see? Less than three weeks away, people, pitchers and catchers start reporting. Is that correct? That's that's wild. That's yeah, I nuts. think that's right. Right around Valentine's Day is usually the time. So, a yeah. uh, little tidbit here before we get to the mailbag. I wanted to mention it because this guy was a part of the team for the last three years. Carlos Carrasco, no longer a Met. He's going back to Cleveland. He got a minor league deal. Uh, he's uh, going to be in his age 36 season. He'll get $2 million if he makes the club in 2024. Uh, and quietly, another piece of the Lindor trade kind of falls out of place. The Lindor trade still kind of feels like it was yesterday to me, but now you got Ahmed Rosario, who was a Dodger and a free agent, and then Cookie Carrasco is back in Cleveland. Uh, the more I look at that trade, the more I'm thankful we made it because we, we locked up Lindor, and he seems like he's only getting better. Uh, but I'm happy for Cookie that he lands somewhere because Cookie is a terrific dude. He's got a terrific story. I'm hoping that that last tough Mets here is not the end for him. Uh, so I was actually I was really happy to see it. I mean, and it's a perfect reunion. I mean, yeah. his history with Cleveland is, 
you know, great. He's an, an amazing person, a great human being. And for him to go back to his roots, it's kind of like finishing his career where it started. Right. If that's this would be the end. But I think they're setting him up for like, hey, man, we'd love you to be a part. I still think he's got some useful innings left sure. in him if, if, you know, if he's uh, if he makes the team. But it's more, you know, once he's done, he's probably going to fall right back into that organization if he wants to. And so I think that's more like welcome home kind of a feeling for him and good for him. Yeah, I definitely love that a lot. Uh, it, it was never going to be a fit for another year with the Mets. Uh, they do have starting pitching depth. In fact, I, I read this weekend that Tyler McGill developed a splitter, which is interesting because he got Kodai Senga in that clubhouse, so maybe he had some influence. But uh, Cookie finds his way back home, and I think the Mets will be able to answer their rotation questions fine with Adam. So it's a nice move. I there. So you, that just reminded me uh, your your tweet that you sent out <laughs> with the uh, with the Jesse Pinkman. We've been, well, I've been through a lot, Jared. Uh, yeah, lot. the uh, the the Tyler McGill is going to hurt me again, kind of. <laughs> thing. But this is this is what you want to hear, of course. Of course. Um, but he did throw that a few times last year, yeah. correct? And I, I'm trying to think of uh, the name that he gave that pitch because he threw they it five about the times goal. last year um to good effect no one got hit off it he <laughs> they, he named it i want to say that in a, in a post gosh this must have been a, like his last outing because i don't remember this i was pretty checked out in september of last year i'm gonna i'm gonna look it up and i'll, I'll get okay. back to you, you get back but to he named it like he, in a really funny post game like because he talked about you know the ghost fork and, right. and learning it and then they, he named it something like hilarious so i appreciated that that sense of humor but yeah it's exciting especially a guy that tall to be able to throw something that's that drops right through the strike zone i think that is such an advantage because his his fastball velocity was up he was pushing it so if he's running that four seamer that split is beautiful we see the success that that kodai had with it it's kind of you know taken over if he can if he can really sustain that pitch it's a beautiful thing yeah i mean things kind of went off the rails for mcgill when he was dialing up that fastball near 98 oh did you find it i found it he called it the uh it was either the spork because it's not a ghost fork or the american spork the american spork i kind (laughs) of like like the split fork (laughs) yeah so i loved it (laughs) and you know tyler's like you know his kind of um quiet demeanor when he's talking he's like yeah and he's put on that that the 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 smile and he was like yeah i think we're gonna call it the american spork which is hilarious <laughs> ever since april 2022 man I, I can't quit him i'm still believing a little bit i mean i'm i believe in him too i think i it's belief, so though. so this is the thing so i talk about it often i don't sure. want to get too far on a tangent but this is what it takes to stick in the big leagues right it's so easy like again i'm like i'm gonna take it a, take nothing away from people it's much easier to get to the big leagues because that's your goal. Right. And then once you get there, how do I stay there? That's what guys have to figure out. You have to adapt. And he, he's constantly trying to evolve and, and, and be a better pitcher. And that's what you want to see from a guy like that. Who's not just resting on his laurels. I know what got me here. I can do that. What he's doing is getting better. Baseball will humble you. And he seems to be uh, hungry and he's been humbled, so I, I love it. I mean, the the thing with me is that it's always been my greatest fear that we we give up on Tyler McGill because you already know that the Rays or the Guardians or the Dodgers are just going to scoop him up and they're going to figure out <laughs> what's wrong and they're going to make him because I'm we're going down the rabbit hole. We're going. No, down yeah, that's that would happen too. Jerry, he would go to the Dodgers and be like their number three. I I can't even I don't even want to speak it into reality because of how real it can be. Um, yeah. Should we listen in, Terry? Do you think it's time? Let's hit the mailbag. Let's hit the mailbag. So we got we picked out five voicemails. We might do more if we end up having time. Uh, the first one comes from actually a friend of mine, uh, Zach, who called in with a pretty general overview question that I think is a good way to kick off our first mailbag in a while. Hey, Jolly and Jerry. This is Zach, a longtime listener, and I'm glad to have you guys back. Um, my question is pretty simple. Um, if you had to pick a ceiling and a floor for this 2024 New York Mets team. How many games think they win? How many games think they lose? What do you think is the most likely scenario? Thanks. Okay. So a little bit of preseason projection. We don't have, 
you know, the Pagoda or the fan graphs to rely on. This is firing from the hip, our raw feelings about it. Do you want to go first or should I lead us off? Uh, I want you to lead us off. I'm okay. curious to see where you go. I've got some numbers written down. I want to, I want to see where you, where you go. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously we can default to the argument that I think every team is using now. That's not a clear cut favorite to win their division. And that's the fact that the Arizona Diamondbacks won 84 games and they made it to the world series. So I think everyone has that a little bit on their mind. Uh, I'm not quite there uh, because I, 2023 was a crushing blow for a lot of Mets fans. I think we expected greatness. We did not get it. We, uh, we burst into flames after 2022. Uh, I do look at this roster and I do think that if everyone is healthy, which, you know, is no guarantee in a full 162, it rarely happens. But if we get a full healthy season from most of our core guys here and our pitchers, uh, this looks like a winning team to me. Now that could mean a lot of things. That could mean 82 and 80. It could mean 90 and 72 uh, with a lot in between there. But I think if you look at it very blankly, you have a top three closer in the game. You have a top 10 starting pitcher in the game, top 15, you could argue. Uh, And then you have a core four uh, hitters at the top of your lineup that can go toe to toe with the best in the league. That is the concrete foundation of a team that should be a winning team. It's going to be up to everything else that Stearns has brought in to fill in the pieces and provide run prevention and good defense and on a day-to-day basis, athleticism that we did not see last year. Uh, so right now, my my biggest upside for the Mets, I have them at an 86 win team, 10 games above 500. Might not be enough for a playoff spot, but might be enough to get fans reinvested and back into the team. I think at their worst, they're the reverse of that. 76 and 86, pretty much similar to what they were last year. Sellers at the deadline, potentially. Um, I think the Mets are are staring at a problem where if they're at a 500 record at the deadline, they have a tough question to answer as to whether or not they go for it, uh, sell or stand pat. But I have uh, the ceiling and the floor a little bit far apart right now because there's a lot of there's just a lot of wild cards on this roster to put it blankly. What what do you have the 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 floor at? I had it at 76 wins. Okay. And then you had it at 86 wins. 86. Yep. Okay. So I I I see everything that you say. For me, the core four of the lineup, the upside of of Senga, the consistency of Quintana and then Edward Diaz in the back end, I think that gives you a floor. 76 feels about right to me. That's sure. the, I wrote down 75. Okay. Um, and the only reason is because of the Phillies and the Braves. You got to play them a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then if the Marlins keep trading pieces away, then I think that it, that becomes a little bit easier of a floor. But I have a much higher ceiling than 86. Yeah? Wow. Yeah, because here here's the thing for me. We're talking ceiling. This yeah. is best case scenario. Sure. I've been on teams. I've been on teams that were picked to finish last, and and we won ninety four games in twenty twelve. Things that people take a step forward. At all things happen that you need them. So this would be, you know, this would be Lindor puts up a very similar season that right. he did last year. Maybe even steps up his average. Uh, Alonso picks up his average, but still hits forty bombs. Uh, Nimmo is healthy. Mm. McNeil returns to hit over 300. And then you have Francisco Alvarez. So to me, that's the wild card. If Alvarez takes a a step forward, develops a lot more consistency, which he's very capable of, uh, that provides another level of pop protection in that lineup. That core four becomes a fab five, if you will. (laughs) Their lineup has a chance to do absolute damage. And then when you're mashing like that, when you're capable of putting three, four guys up that can hit 20 plus home runs and a couple of guys that might hit 40. I mean, for for me, Alvarez's ceiling is a 40 homer guy. Like yeah. that's not out of the question for me. Um, you, you, you're going to mash the lower half starting pitchers with yeah. just simple offense, okay? And then if you have Kodai Singa return to form, maybe take a step forward. Quintana looked incredible last year. We talked about Tyler McGill's tweaks that he's made. David Peterson's out there and still has some ability to, to be a sustainable, successful big league pitcher. I, I believe in what they have. And then Diaz is still Edwin Diaz, which I fully right. expect him to, to be the number one. You said top three. I think that's conservative, to be honest. Sure. I think it's legit. But um, I think he fits there. 
You could win. For me, the, their ceiling is is 94 wins. Okay. That's a ceiling. Now, that's not where I think they end up. I think I do think that they can they can squeak into that 80 86 and and win. That's kind of where I expect them to go. 86 88 wins, but I'm going to put it at 96 as their ceiling. Okay. That was a very confident 96 too. There was no shit. Yeah, man. In the I, tone I, it's crazier things have happened and they're so talented. Yeah. You know, they won 101 games with minimal Scherzer, right? Minimal Degrom, and basically the same core of people. Yeah. You know, a lot's riding on return to form of McGill, and we didn't even talk about or um, McNeil, and we didn't even talk about Starling Marte and what right. he can provide. Um, yeah, man, I think I'm always going to be an optimist, and I've been in every spring training. For the most part, you're like, we could we could do some crazy things here with this lineup. And it never, you know, it doesn't always work out. Most of the time, baseball is beautiful and a and a data-driven sport because you regress to the mean most right. more often than not. But man, the the ceiling we're talking about ceiling, I bet they the, I bet they could reach 96 wins. I mean, Jerry, here's what I'll say. So a lot of what I said was was contingent on what is the rotation? Is are we gonna be rolling out two good starting pitchers and the other three days we're getting our ass kicked? What happens there? And then the back half, the lineup. Um, fan graphs employs a lot of people that are smarter than me and Jerry combined. Uh, and they do their steamer projections. We've used them before on our PPPs to talk about players. They have the entire Mets starting nine at above league average for their projections for 2024. That includes Brett Beatty. It includes DJ Stewart. It includes Mark Vientos at 108, which was crazy to me. And Francisco Alvarez at 112 on their weighted runs created plus. I mean, take that with the heaviest grain of salt you can find in your cupboard. But at the same time, like also get get a little excited about it because <laughs> that's just not what I was expecting when I clicked on Steamer and got ready to offer a rebuttal to you. And instead, now I'm kind of reinforcing your optimism. Um, so there's a lane. There's always a lane and a full 162. And don't don't become so jaded that you can't allow yourself to get excited during spring training because that's what spring training is about, man. That's what it's Fast. about. That's exactly it. There's, there's, you know, that's, that's, you love spring because everybody with the, the blooming of the flowers, <laughs> get blooms, opt, get blo- blooms optimism for right. the teams they are willing to put it together. Now be blessed that you're, you're a Mets fan because you do have optimism regardless of the disappointment of the free agency market and how it's progressed or, you know, whatever the case may be, you still got a shot you got hope you got hope you know you're not you're not the nationals you're you know you're not doing what the a's are doing you know you've got a shot so i think all things being equal why why not the mets who knows well speaking of spring training uh we do have a second call here it is from a long time caller a long time fan a fan that we love uh linda at velcro baby on twitter sent us in a very nice voicemail Hey, Jack and Jerry, it's Linda, a.k.a. Velcro Baby. I am so happy that you guys are back, and I just have two questions. Any thoughts of going to spring training this year? And also, Jerry, my son, the Braves fan, wanted to know what that hat was that you were wearing at the last episode. All right, guys, really looking forward to more episodes. Take care. Have a great day. Beautiful. Thank you, Linda. First of all, like, I mean, there's people in this world that give you like appreciation and gratitude for, for putting yourself out there and doing what we do. She's so always there for us. Even when we had that, (laughs) like, I am so appreciative of what she's done. Um, that's amazing. So first I'll address the hat. So I remember the hat. I, I looked back on it when I was checking the voicemails. I was wearing, it's called Line of Trade, and she thought it was probably, or her son, the Braves fan, probably thought it was Tomahawks Mm. when they were actually like sledgehammers, you know, hence Line of Trade. I have another hat from that same group that's an anvil, so it's basically like a blacksmith kind of thing. Definitely not a Tomahawk, um, which I think might be banned. You can't do the chop anymore. Well, people still do the chop. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) People definitely do. Uh, But it wasn't Braves oriented, but... uh, yeah, yeah, I was, was gonna say on the on the first pod back, if you wore a a chop hat, right? That's well, I mean, our crazy. audio jack was wearing a Yankees hat. Well, they couldn't the see that though. You know, it's not on camera that's at true. all times. Can Even, you see this one? 
I thought it was a pineapple at first. Now I'm not sure. Hold is on. that like corn on the cob? What is that? Can you see it? I can kind of see. I don't know what it is, though. So it's it's a an R logo. A little self-plug here. Okay. Um, so the uh, Field of Dreams, um, my old teammate and I, there's uh, Drew Storen, Tyler Clippard, and we've got a couple other people. Oh, but that's we a have reliever these, bunch right there. <laughs> the, the Field of Dreams whiskey, bourbon. Mm. Um, we have the exclusive rights to the corn from the Field of Dreams. No way. Yeah, and so that's a so that, <laughs> what? that's I know it's wild, super cool. Look it up. That but this is the one of the up. logos. Drew uh, Storen is an artist as well. Oh, it's so cool. Uh, yeah, so cool. And so I think he's done a good job. Obviously, there's some some stuff that goes into it, but it's a it's an ear of corn, you know, with kind of opened yeah. up, and instead of corn on the inside, it's baseballs. So, so just just so I can get this straight for the record, uh, you're the first episode back. You wear a hat that's almost mistaken for a Braves hat, and then the second episode back, you wear a hat in remembrance to your Nationals teammates. Is that is that what I'm hearing? That is what I'm hearing. So Jerry, we're on now we're thin ice. now we're fellow like employees. Now we're, we're on co-workers. thin ice right now. We need a Mets hat or a Mets adjacent hat or even New York hat next episode, or else you might be. Uh, out. I'll go put on my helmet. You How might about be that? Yeah, the helmet is what the people are asking for. Um, oh. I'll answer the uh, the first part of the question. Spring training plans. Right now, there we don't have anything in the works. I actually just pitched uh, to go to Arizona uh, for a different kind of spring training content trip. Uh, so no Port St. Lucie plans. I did get to talk to uh, a Mets prospect who I won't I won't reveal, but he's currently in Port St. Lucie working on his stuff. We had a great conversation, uh, so that'll be coming to Shea Station soon. But as of right now, no plans to go back to Florida. Yeah, so I, I do have plans. Um, it's not set in stone yet not for SNY. I think there I'm going to do two different stints. Whoa. In, but we're, you know, in that contract negotiation, ironing out all the details. Uh, it ha- doesn't get the same headlines as Keith Hernandez's yeah, contract figure. negotiations. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, we're figuring we're figuring it out. Um, I will be in spring training at least once during during this year. Okay, so. I haven't ruled out just going as a fan. Like if I'm gonna go, I just want to chill i don't want to be a, you know filming anything i just want to watch the boys and see what we got. yeah it's cool man see what we got on this roster but yeah thank you for your <laughs> thank call. you linda appreciate it linda uh we got a few more here this one's a little bit more serious on the nose and it's something you talked about a little bit last episode that i want you to expand on it has to do with the number one of the staff kodai Senga. yeah hey, Jolly and jerry this is cooper from farmville long island i'm a huge mets fan and a huge fan of you guys doing the chase station podcast I just want to know your thoughts on the future of Kodai Senga and how do you think he'll perform for his rest of the time with the Mets? Let me know, and I can't wait to hear your opinions on it. All right, thank you guys so much, and let's go Mets. Thank you, Cooper. Jerry, you want to take lead here? I do. Uh, thank you, Cooper. Did he say Fargo, Long Island? I can check for you right now. Uh, I didn't know. I was like Fargo. Farmville. That makes a lot more Farmville. sense. Farmville. I was like Fargo, North Dakota. Wow. We, oh, <laughs> then he said Long Island. So thank I you, Cooper. So for for me, uh, there's a lot of variables here for Kodai Singa. I I am a huge Kodai Singa fan. I am a supporter. I loved every bit of what I saw from him last year. Um, I am not worried about him getting worse. Mm. Um, it is a possibility, though. He's now, uh, the league has an entire year worth of data, worth of video on him. There's not going to be any any surprises. So he's not going to, the more times you face a player or the more times you have video of yourself, the more, uh, the less advantage you have as a pitcher. Now, he's very good. So he's going to be good regardless. Um, his ability to throw strikes last year was the key for me. His ability, his his strike throwing was what kind of gave him a hard time when he was in Japan, when he wasn't at the his best. It was because his inconsistency of throwing strikes. And he did a great job last year. Um, his competitive nature is really good. I truly do think he will take a step forward. I think he'll be an all-star again. Um, but I don't want to put the pressure and i don't think it's not that it's fair or unfair it doesn't matter i just wish they would have put somebody alongside of him to help push him you know i think it was a big 
help for him to see all the pressure that went towards Verlander and Scherzer last year to kind of take a back seat and get through your growing pains. There's going to be so much pressure on him this year that he's going to have to stand in front of his locker and answer a lot more questions, I think. And I, I, I'm just, I'm open to the variability that he's not going to be uh, a sub two five guy. Yeah, and he could be a an excellent pitcher. I like I said, I expect him to be returned to the all star level form, but um, I just, I don't want to. I won't be surprised if he has like a, a a little bit of a step back as far as performance because there's so many variables that go into it. If that made any sense, no, it, it definitely did, and uh, it's it's not exactly fair to Kodai for for me to do this, but my mind always goes to okay, what did other Japanese players do in their sophomore seasons? And there's there's two sides of the coin here. Um, one is Masahiro Tanaka, who I think is one of the more recent, more accurate examples to comp. Kodai Senga to his first year. He was one of the best pitchers in the league. He was an all-star just like Senga was fifth and rookie of the year voting. And he had a 2.77 ERA and 20 starts. But like you said, when everybody, when every team gets a taste of you and can see what you're all about, uh, it makes it harder to fool them with the same tricks again. In his second year, he wasn't bad by any means. In fact, he was well above league average, but he did take a step back. He had a 3.5 ERA and 24 starts. You also have someone like you Darvish who came into the league in 2012, lit the league on fire, but you know, wasn't, you know, out of this world. Great. And then he really took a huge step in his second year. He finished runner up in Cy Young voting. So either one of these things can happen for Kodai Senga. He has such a unique arsenal and has great velocity that I think if he's able to throw even more strikes than he did last year, he still had a, a 4.2 walk per nine rate, which is not ideal. If he's able to rectify that, I still think that he's going to be among the best pitchers in the league, but like you said, asking him to step into this number one role when he was below Verlander and Scherzer last season is going to be a lot. Uh, it's still looking like one of the better pitcher contracts in baseball. You know, fifteen million a year for a guy that finished top five in Cy Young voting is incredible. Um, but I, I do anticipate a little bit of a step step back, and that's go, that's why uh, guys like Manaya, Quintana, and Severino are going to be really important to add ammunition behind to make sure this is a well rounded rotation. Uh, but I still have all the belief in the world that Kodai Senga will be great next year. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I I I can't wait to watch him pitch. I'm truly a, a fan from the craft right. aspect, from him doing something that I did. I enjoy every bit of what he brings to the table. I just want to temper expectations that it it's baseball's hard, man. It's yeah. the best level. He had a lot of question marks. This is his first season wear and tear on his arm like that the grind of a six month long season, including, you know, he's going to be 31 this season. It's, right. it's not like, you know, uh, it's not like, you know, the easiest you Darvish was 26 in his second year. So it's a little bit different variables. Uh, but I, I do think that he could have an equally good season sub three, you know, I just wouldn't, I don't want people to expect him to, to be, in the hunt for the Cy Young, you know, but yeah. so it's just expectations are different, but I, I truly do expect him to be an all-star level pitcher. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. And if the Mets are in the range where Kodai Senga is the guy who was last year, that completely changes my outlook on the season. Um, but it's going to come down to the supporting cast. And I, I think that Senga, if he's another all-star year here, I mean, you're really happy with that. And you start thinking about, the way his contract is structured, I believe he has an opt out in year three, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and if Kodai Senga is the guy he was, uh, he's gonna he's gonna get a nice little contract if he does opt out there. So I'm hoping he stays in med as long as possible, and I want him to succeed. But there's there's all these extraneous factors. Um, but regardless, he's a really fun pitcher to watch, and that's what I'm regardless to the most. must watch TV. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we got one more question here before we wrap up today's episode. Uh, it's obligatory since we are in the off season that we do Hall of Fame talk because actually there's a lot of Mets on the ballot right now, uh, and one of them, David Wright, who's near and dear to many Mets fans' hearts, survived this year. I believe he got just above six percent. Uh, he's not the only Met there, but we had a question revolving around that. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Eric from Queens. Uh, Jolly, Jerry, it's great to have you back. Anyway, let's get on with the question. David Wright gets 6% of the Hall of Fame vote. Now, do you think that he'll, in years' time, 
make it to the make it to the threshold and make it into the hallowed halls? If not, who do you think is the next potential Met to make it there? That's my question. I love David Wright. I loved watching him play, but God, I hope he gets in the Hall of Fame, but I don't think he's going to make it. What do you guys think? All right. Love you guys. Can't wait to hear you. Bye. Great question, Eric. Um, I love the, him telling himself to get on with the question as if there's a, another person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, he's gets in. Like yeah. I, I, I truly think, you know, all things being equal, had he been healthy, I think he would have been a Hall of Famer. I, I don't think there's a doubt in my mind that his sustained success was all trajectory towards Cooperstown. Yeah. But that's that's why it's so hard. You have to have sustained success to be capable of getting in. He'll be a he'll be a ring of honor, yeah, inner circle New York Met. Um, but I don't think he gets into Cooperstown. But good for him. For, for surviving another year, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you go down the list of one and dones in MLB history, and it's egregious between Carlos Delgado or Kevin Brown, any of those guys who were well deserving of their acclaim that fell off in one year. I'm happy Wright is not part of that club. Um, but the perfect example to, to point to when, in this discussion is Adrian Beltre, who you had a really nice message about. Uh, that you posted on socials recently because Beltre um, was among, you know, great players in the first 10 years of his career from age 20 to 30. He was just as much war as Bryce Harper and Manny Machado. I think that gets lost in translation a little bit. It's the back half that nailed it for him, that made him a first ballot Hall of Famer because he was even better in his 30s. And that's extremely rare. Uh, and right didn't even really get the chance to be better in his thirties or at least get those counting numbers where he wanted them to be uh, because of, you know, damn spinal stenosis, which I, which I haven't heard of since, which is just absolutely ridiculous. But you look at those first 10 or so years of his career and you just marvel at the fact that the Mets had this caliber of player on their roster year in and year out. Um, so I'm very happy he gets the year number two. I don't know if he ever gets there, but there aren't two Mets on the ballot right now that could get in next year. Okay. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that I was in the AL during this run, but yeah. the fact that you had David Wright in New York and Ryan Zimmerman in Washington, yeah. two third basemen that were incredible. Like that, what a fun time to be a fan. Came of the league at the day. same time too, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Then they're from about this, you know, very similar areas, I believe. Um, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Both Virginia boys, I think. Um, yeah. Zimmerman, he's going to be an interesting case when he hits the ballot. Um, but the other two that I was alluding to before, Carlos Beltran and Billy Wagner. Wagner almost had it this year, and I really did think uh, that this was going to be his year. Uh, we have a guy in the office, Lucas, who helps me do uh, baseball trivia videos sometimes, and he's a way bigger statner than I am. And he does all the, the computer math for balloting and stuff like that. And he told me a week out from the results that Wagner wasn't getting in. And I didn't believe him, but he was right. Um, yeah. But Wagner so does feel like a, a year 10 guy that could get in. He absolutely deserves it. He's one of the best closures in the game ever. Uh, Carlos Beltran is also on that ballot too. And you have caveats with him between multiple different teams and the 2017 Astros scandal. But at the same time, uh, during his peak, he was one of the best defensive center fielders and off as offensive center fielders at the same time. Um, those are two guys that could feasibly go into the, in the, into the hall wearing Mets hats, which excites me because we haven't had that since Piazza. Uh, what do you think of those two guys? Uh, I think they both get in. Yeah. I truly do. I think um, Billy Wagner, it's been weird. So there was a lot of love during like the Dennis Eckersley era mm -hmm. of relievers and they won more Cy Youngs than I think they deserved in a sense sure. like that. Just, um, But now I feel like it's swung the other way where guys that Billy Wagner was so dominant yeah. for so long. To me, that is when I think of a Hall of Famer, I want to think of somebody that dominated an era and whatever it was that they did. And Billy Wagner was an absolute force for so long as a reliever. Um, yeah, man, I think he's special. Does it count if he if he's going to be uh, met in the Hall of Fame? Because I, the caveat is if Billy Wagner gets in, he's not wearing a Mets hat. No, nah, he's probably wearing think. an Astros hat. Yeah, I think he's going to be wearing an Astros hat. Yeah. Um, so maybe that takes him off. I mean, what hat does Beltron wear if, or, or what, if he gets in? Is so he, that's, is he... that's the question I ask myself a lot. Cause he yeah. Beltron, I mean, usually a thing that counts against you in Hall of Fame balloting is, uh, if you weren't a one team guy like Maurer twins, his whole career, Helton, twi uh, 
Helton. Rockies his whole career. Why did I say Twins again? Uh, Beltron played for one, two, three, seven different teams in his career. Uh, his longest stint was with the Royals, technically. Uh, but those Mets years, I think, are what people remember the most between 2006 and his only 40 homer season being in the Mets blue. A couple gold gloves there as well. Like, I think feasibly he wears a Mets hat, but there was a lot of discussion about is Piazza going to wear a Dodgers hat or a Mets hat when he gets in. Uh, so I think it'll be a lingering conversation, but 70 war player, rookie of the year, world series winner, nine time all-star like Beltran's got all the pieces he needs uh, to eventually get into the hall of fame. Yeah. I think he's going to be later in his tenure, maybe not even on because the, the, the Astro scandal yeah. it looms large. It's the first time we're seeing it in the hall of fame discussion too. I believe. Yeah. You know, I don't think he, he's been, he's a part of the Mets front office and stuff. And, and I don't think he should be, I, I'm a little bit, I, I really don't, I hate the scandal. I hate the cheating that was done Sure. Uh, with the Astros. I think it's one of the ugliest things. And I know a lot of people are over it. Um, you know, said goodbye to it, but uh, yeah, but I think from a guy that played it, it's such a trashy move, like no, no offense to the trash can, but it's so unclassy. It's, it's not, it's such bullshit to what they did. Um, and there's a lot of baseball guys that are like, you know, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying like that. To me, that is the every, you know, I don't want to get political, but I think there's a candidate that lives his life like that. And is like, you know, I'm just going to do this and say this and get away with whatever I can. If I'm not trying to do that, then it's not my fault. I can do it. I can get away with it. That I think is what's wrong with people that try to cheat like that. And the character thing in there. It sucks. Like, yeah. I think he deserves and I think he will get into the Hall of Fame and I want him to get in the Hall of Fame. But I understand not voting for him, at least for a while to kind of like, you know, it's a punishment because it's it's ugly. Yeah. I mean, character is something that gets drawn to a lot of ballots. We've seen a lot of guys get omitted from the Hall because of that very thing. The relationship you have with press, the way you have po- poised yourself in previous years while you were a player just off the field. Um, it's no doubt that Beltron did most of his work to get into the hall of fame before the scandal. The scandal was his last year in the league. He won the world series and then he retired. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the punctuation mark on his yeah. career. It's going to be really, really hard to ignore. That, that's the difference really though. I'm going to, between the steroid things, you can question a guy's entire stats right. by, because he was, was he cheating the entire time? I don't think Carlos Beltron was watching video it's impossible because they didn't have the same technology for his entire career and until towards the end there um so his career isn't as tainted as the steroids guys but that is such a gross cheating scandal that still bothers me to this day um with some the way some people handled it uh you know i i don't think he'd I don't think it should prevent him from being in the Hall of Fame, but I do I do get it. So. And this is a good part about what makes Shea great. You the player's perspective and the fan perspective because it's two entirely different worlds when it comes to a topic like this. Uh, Beltron, fundamental part of my childhood, uh, for better or for worse. And yeah, it's no secret that like my commentary on him hinges on that, but also hinges on the most recent thing he did as a player. So it's one of the more interesting cases, far more complicated than that of Billy Wagner, which I think is a very one dimensional. He was a top five closer in baseball history. He deserves to be in the hall of fame. I'm open year 10. He gets in Mets hat or not. Yeah. So if let's, let's finish this question. Yeah. Let's assume that they both get in, but they're both wearing a different hat. Who is the next Met Ooh, to get in. That's think. a good question, Jerry. That's an yeah. excellent question. That's the end of that question. So who's the next Met? Okay, so it's I don't think it's anybody from that team uh between Beltron, Delgado, right, whatever. Uh it's not gonna be Johan, unfortunately, because he just doesn't have the volume that goes with a lot of those starting pitchers. So I think you have to push to like more recent teams, like twenty fifteen, but I don't know if there's anybody on that team either. Um yeah. 
Degrom yeah. is that the answer? Is it Jacob Degrom? Because again, we're we're in this discussion where the 30s are going to be big because he came into the league pretty late. He was a 26 year old, uh, so right now he has 10 year service time. But a lot of those years, he doesn't even have 20 starts in the season. What do you think? I mean, he, he's the choice. Yeah. But since 2019, I, I mean, he's he's thrown less than 90 innings every season. I know. Or I guess in 2021, he threw 92. Still. But he's he could if he has success, a dominant season or two to push him over the edge. I think he gets in. To me, he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, maybe not. It's it's hard for me because I want to say you know, just like David Wright, you have to do it for a while. Yeah, but this guy was head and shoulders above every single pitcher on the planet for a four year period. Yeah. Easily. You know, I mean, in 2021, seasons. he was on pace to have the greatest starting pitcher season ever, and then he got hurt. Yeah, yeah. I, I so kind of love that in. It's 18, 19, 20, <sighs> and then... It, yeah, and from then 2018 to, 20. to 2021, he makes 91 starts. He has a 1.94 ERA. Yeah. That's ridiculous. So, Those are video I think. Numbers. I think... And I, I believe in his, I believe in his competitiveness. I think he, he, you know, I hope, I hope to see it because of, as a fan of the game, I think him coming back and being dominant next season and one more great season like that, or two very, very good seasons. And I think he has enough to get it. I mean, we've seen guys that have won multiple Cy Youngs, back to back Cy Youngs, even knock it into the hall. And it's no question. The typical point is, Tim Lincecum. I mean, he was, he was, his rise is as quick as his fall, but he was dominant in the league for multiple seasons. If DeGrom can put together a few more 150 inning plus seasons, you know, he's going to be good. You know, the talent is still there. The arm is still alive. Um, but it is going to come down to that. He's going to be 36 next season. He's probably got four, five more years in the league, unless he's a Randy Johnson type, which who knows however long he has. Um, I think he's the closest thing we have right now. So, and yeah. I think if he goes in, he'll wear a Mets hat. I don't, I don't have any doubt there. Uh, well, so that's we'll yeah, there, that's a no doubt. Yeah. So, yeah. God, thinking about Jacob Degrom gets me all emotional. All right, I think that is all the time we have for our mailbag episode. This was a lot of fun. You guys sent in a ton of good questions. We apologize if we didn't get to your question because there there was a lot. Um, but who knows? Maybe we'll do another mailbag in the near future. Yeah, thank you guys so much for for tuning in and for sending us those voicemails. We appreciate you. Let's go Mets. Let's listen to this absolutely wonderful outro because I spam listen to it all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Jerry and Charlie. Shay Station. that. Jerry and Charlie. Thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed the show. Station.